Okay, thank you, uh, Chancellor Farina and Mayor de Blasio as well. And we're going to start right now with questions. So we're going to ask people to line up on this. love doing it. And thank you, I would say that's the key thing, is the community making clear what it needs, what it believes will make the school a success, and we will work to match it. So time for a little commercial advertisement while Lorraine is here. Thank you very much for helping us get that White Castle site over on 69th Street and 34th Avenue. Thank you. Very much Thank you. And that didn't come about because of people telling me that that site was available and then me getting a hold of Lorraine. So when Lorraine mentions that if you know of sites, tell us, tell the elected officials where those sites are before other people can get to them and we can possibly get them and make them smooth. Thank you, Lorraine. But what would be the chances of having another one? Because there's a great demand in the community and parents really are lucky to get in the lottery and get, and get this prize. So we're looking forward, hopefully, that we'll get another one uh, for our community. Thank you. Thank you. So, um, look, we are trying to make sure that there are good options for all children. And we value every child in this school system. The vast majority of kids are in traditional public schools. The kids in charter schools, we're here to serve as well. And we work very well with a lot of charter schools. Where, excuse me, a charter school needs space, and we think is one that is doing well and obviously um, respecting the ground rules that we think are important in terms of working with other surrounding schools and ensuring that they are engaging all types of children, including special needs kids and English language learners. We work with a lot of charters that meet that description and we're able to help them find the space they need. And then sometimes space, like everywhere else, is a challenge for all of us. We'll work with anyone. But remember, at the same time, as I said in the beginning, our job is to lift up every school. Uh, parents, in some cases, are looking for a different option because they don't have faith in their neighborhood school. That is not an acceptable state of affairs. That's not something that Carmen and I will accept. That's why we have a plan to entirely change this school system so that any parent in the neighborhood can feel good about their school. I think the previous system of governance had an immense amount of problems. Unfortunately, there was a lot of corruption, not everywhere, but plenty of places. Uh, a lot of things didn't move. And the things that I have outlined to you tonight, how do we go from 20,000 kids in a full day pre-K to 65,000 kids in a full day pre-K? How do we double the number of kids in after school programs at the middle school level? Right now, by the way, any parent with a child in middle school, you can have a guaranteed free seat in after school for your child. That was not the case a few years ago. But you have a right now to a seat in an after school program for your child for free if, you do, if your child's in middle school. Those things happened very quickly, very intensely, because mayoral control gave me the power to make them happen quickly. So that's one part of the answer. In terms of CECs, part of why I told you I was a community school board member is, of course, I feel kindred to CECs. We believe they bring a lot of valuable insight, a lot of valuable proposals. I feel, and my chancellor spent a lot of time meeting with CECs, I feel like CECs are very crucial to helping us understand what will work and not work. So if you're having a different experience, I want to figure out what we can do better, but I know this chancellor is committed to hearing what CECs have, have to say. That's not me, we're always going to agree, right? Because we, you and I might disagree on mayoral control of education, we might disagree on the Pan American Hotel, which we do disagree on, but that doesn't, we absolutely believe the voices of parents are going to tell us a lot of things we don't see. They're going to tell us, I think you're right, how to streamline and speed up things, because there's plenty of things in the Department of Education that still have to be made better. I'm very concerned, for example, and have been for years, that the way we support parents of children with special needs has to be much more compassionate and much more a streamlined. We've made some real progress for that, but there's more to do. That happened because parents, and I know this from my own experience before as public advocate, parents showed us what had to change. And a lot of us took up that cause, and that's part of why the changes are happening now. So we value CECs a lot, in my view. Carmen. First of all, uh, I meet with the CEC presidents once a month on Saturdays. We purposely pick Saturdays, so we'd be uninterrupted. It's an hour and a half meeting. Uh, we listen to their concerns. We certainly know that one of the major uh, decisions left to CECs is rezoning. We also have a new head now of the Parent Engagement Office on purpose so that she can engage more with the CECs starting this year. As a matter of fact, I started my first one last week. We're now meeting with CPAC presidents once a month. Uh, I meet with every CPAC president's council. 
around the city. Last year, I did over 40 town hall meetings at the CEC discussions. The reality is, there are I'm, we're ready to listen. I meeting I went to this week for the CEC in the Bronx, District 11, gave me three things to think about, two of which I was able to change within a day. But there are other things that people will say that we're not going to go back to the good old days. We're not going to because they weren't so good. So the idea of CECs choosing their own principles, not going to happen, at least not under us. Um, and I want to be honest because what we know that some districts took advantage of this and everybody was related to somebody who got a job. And I think we need to be extremely honest about what was bad and what was good. And we want to somehow be in the middle of how we move forward. Okay, thank you. I'm a teacher at PS 239, and first of all, I just have to say thank you so much for treating teachers as professionals. It's been a long time, um, a career changer, and for the first time in 12 years, I feel like I can truly teach the way I want to teach. I really appreciate that. Public school parent, I was very troubled that teachers were not being respected. And so then, are you surprised if teachers do not feel respected, they're not being given enough uh, professional training opportunities, uh, they're not being given the foundation for success, which I think is providing early childhood education for all children. If you look at all the things we weren't doing for education, and then if you look at the tone taken towards teachers, is it a surprise that a lot of very good, very committed, talented people decided they were no longer going to be teachers? So we were hemorrhaging talented teachers. And one of the things that Carmen has taught me over the years is there's nothing is going to change the school system more than recruiting and retaining the very best teachers for the long haul. But that's why we're doing the big teachers. Trailers. So it will take a while. We're, we're committed to school by school, getting rid of trailers, but we're not going to lie about the fact that it takes a while because there's real physical challenges. So right now we have a $490 million, almost half a billion dollar initiative over the next five years. And most of that money is focused on replacing trailers with permanent facilities. It's going to be methodical work. And we have made some progress over time, and our predecessors made some progress, but this is one that's going to take a while. But half a billion dollars is real money, and that's a good, strong start. Thank you. Proactive, and I think your honor loves immigrants, and loves education. We believe in your honor. We voted for you. We campaigned for you. But we really need you to consider this. The city is made up of many millions of immigrants who are the foundation of our economy. What is your honor going to do to make our dreams a reality? What is your honor going to do to empower those strategic strategic partners that you're talking about to learn English okay. and make progress. Okay. And Bavio's amazing initiative is our community school initiative. We have 130 schools around the city which are built on the principle that schools are part of communities and therefore schools should be there to serve the full community. So these are schools that within them have a variety of services for me with everything from after school programs, vision programs, uh, adult education programs. Uh, and the theory that we know that children who come to school with strong families, who come to school with a strong nutrition program, who come to school uh, with the right clothing, who come to school from stable households, are more likely to be able to succeed when they get to school. But one of the many ways that we are making sure uh, that we're really partnering with families, one of the great things that happened this summer is that we actually knocked on the doors of 35,000 families, 35,000 families at these, at these community schools. And we did it to make sure that parents knew that we were starting a new day, a new partnership to work with them. So again, I'm not familiar, familiar with the program cut that you're describing. And Carmen's going to talk about what we're doing, but the point I want to emphasize about Richard's role and about what we're doing with the community schools is a lot of those community schools are adding adult literacy programs for the explicit reason, not only that it is empowering and it's everything we value, but we need those kids to succeed, and the sooner their parents learn English and can work with them on the reading and the homework, the better. So we agree very much philosophically. We're going to get you the information. Please follow up with our team on what's happening in the community schools. Carmen's going to tell you more, and then you know, we'll follow up from there. Go ahead, Carmen. Hi. Our question, look, I think there's been real progress made because we took a very different approach. And we realized that there were some very talented people in that ATR pool that had just been caught in the crossfire of school changes. And let's face it, in the previous 
In the previous approach, a lot of schools were being closed, a lot of people were being phased out very arbitrarily, and plenty of them were very talented teachers. So I think we have done much better at getting those folks into new assignments. I don't think we're done yet, and I don't think everyone is a perfect teacher, but, but there are certainly, I think we've shown that with a better approach, more people are getting assigned more quickly. Thank you. And our question is in relation to school security agents. So under the Giuliani mayoral ship in 1998, school security guards were put under the NYPD, despite community opposition to this proposal. And now with the recent assault at Spring Valley High School, where it is clear that cops often do not belong in education environments, would you as a progressive mayor be willing to consider legislation that would bring back the 5,200 SSAs under the DOE? I appreciate the question. As a progressive mayor, I think what we're doing is fixing the existing system. Now look, the, the previous approach didn't work on some levels, but it did work on the level, I'm not talking about the discipline approach where I had real differences, but in terms of achieving safer schools, there was some real progress made. And we need to keep our schools safe. Our solution, and you may have seen what we've put out recently, we're changing the approach to discipline profoundly. Suspensions are down quite a bit. Uh, we think we have a much more fair approach. We also think we've rebalanced the equation so that the school leadership has a very different relationship with the school safety agents. I think there was too much separation in the past, and now we've created much more unity in the approach and much more deference to some of the needs of the school leadership and the school community. So I think in the name of safety, keeping the school safety agents under the NYPD is right. But I think we've made a series of reforms that will allow for a much more balanced approach. Do you want to add? Yes. Uh, one of my favorite topics among many. Um, we have done a tremendous amount of retraining of school safety officers. Last year, for example, we hosted a celebration and we asked principals to nominate school safety agents that actually smile at you when you walk in the building. Uh, that go above and beyond in working with students. So we try to change the tone, and I will tell you that I see a difference. I actually get smiled at when I walk into a building rather than what you're doing here kind of look. Um, so I think that's important, but I do understand also the concern that people have that sometimes they act more like police officers rather than, you know, advocates for kids. And that's something that we've actually are, are reviewing. Um, I do meet with people at NYPD. And I think um, they have taken a, a more of an open um, stance about having these discussions and working together. Thank you. One of those hemorrhage teachers that you were talking about before, um, I was a public school teacher in Queens for, for eight years, um, and I left to go teach at a private school when I I felt just like you were saying, Mary you, kind of restricted and unable to grow in the public school system. Um, so I understand that one of your administration's goals is to improve that experience. Um, I'm also a father of a kindergartner who is encountering the same kind of curriculum that I felt restricted by, um, a scripted Pearson, Ready Gen, Go Math program in his school. Um, and so I'm seeing a little bit of the same thing that I was noticing when I was in the schools with, with him. So I was wondering if you or um, Chancellor Freenia could speak a little bit more about the specific reforms that are going into making teaching a better place uh, or a better profession. I will public. start and I will pass to Carmen who is raring to answer this question. So, we are going to incessantly train our teachers to be better all the time. And you can see in the way we have now organized the week what a devotion there is to professional development. We're going to give you a stronger pool of kids to work with because we're starting with universal pre-K. We're going to invest in the reading specialists to bring kids up to reading level at second and third grade. So wherever you are along the continuum, you're going to be dealing with kids more ready to learn, which I think, I'm not a teacher, but I think it must be more gratifying for teachers to have kids more able to learn and more confident in their learning. We're going to increase opportunities for teachers to work their way up in the system. We have master teachers, model teachers. We have improved the ability of our own teachers to get to those AP and principal jobs, unlike the previous administration that often preferred outsiders. We want our own teachers to go up to those because no one, no one is better ready to lead a New York City public school than someone who taught in a New York City public school. So that's a fundamental reality. A lot of things have changed. 
some of the things that have changed are that the AE minutes on Mondays are also decided by teachers in the building. There's a personnel committee. Teachers get together and decide what they want more of or less of based on the school data. We now have, you have the opportunity, since you're not in the system, to shop for a school that has your philosophy. We went back to Pearson last year and we said, guys, this doesn't work for us. And they helped us rewrite a lot of the ready gen work to the point that it's a lot more open-ended. We've invested in working with Teachers College and the, the reading and writing workshop model. Many schools in this district use it as well. We have also gone back and said, there is no one way to do math. Go math may not be the answer. From these ladies I was talking to before, they're doing envisioning, some people are doing turn. So I think it's a much more flexible system that teachers do have the right to do this. So my advice to you as a teacher, shop for a school that matches your philosophy. But there's plenty of that in the public school system because we're not lockstep in doing something. And one of the things I think you should know is that we're getting tremendous feedback on our pre-K curriculum. The curriculum for pre-K is all about joy, it's all about play, it's all about hands-on. I go into a school and I see sand, I see water, I say, oh my God, thank God I'm not a pre-K teacher. Um, but that's what I would want for my child, it's only what I want for my grandchild. So I would say, do things are changing? Well, the recent data shows that suspensions and arrests have gone down, which is good for our communities. But suspensions continue to disproportionately impact black and Latino students. Look, thank you for how you started, because it reflects reality. A fundamental series of changes that we can see already. There are sometimes when things change and it takes years and years to show, this is happening immediately. The suspensions and arrests are down right away. First level of reform, we've shown real results. We're going to continue to work with a host of advocates and community leaders, parents, students, et cetera, to deepen those reforms. I got to be straight up about the fact that we are balancing real safety needs in the school, but we will not allow something we think is disparity. So that's why to the previous question on the similar topic, we think finding a balance point where we know schools are safe, the discipline is fair, it's not overutilized, it's not used in a disparate fashion. That is the goal we're trying to strike. I totally agree, and I would also say that one of the, the jobs I've given my deputy chancellors and my whole leadership team is to go to visit schools that are either listed as persistently dangerous or dangerous and look at those specific statistics. The other thing that we're really zeroing in on, that in the infractions that seems to cause the most problem, is something called insubordination. And working with school principals and working with the NYPD, we're looking at what, what do we mean by insubordination? And insubordination is sometimes in the eyes of the older, and we've got to make that more consistent. We can't judge this child because he has his hat on backwards, and this child in a different school, he has his hat on backwards, so what? So that's where we're looking at it, because we find that it's in that category that we see the most disparity. Yeah, I, I want you to just take in from on, this, this is not an easy subject, obviously. Three and a half billion over the next five years for new capacity, and on top of that, another half billion for class size reduction, which essentially means removing trailers and replacing them with permanent capacity. It's four billion dollars, and it's not enough. I'm very comfortable telling you here in public it's not enough. I don't have more. You know, there may be a day where I can find more, but right now I don't have more than four million dollars, four billion dollars to put into that. Um, it will mean 1,500 new seats for District 30, which by any normal measure would be a whole lot of new seats, except District 30 is so outstandingly popular. Um, but what we are doing on top of the pure creating of seats is we're trying to address what happens in the classroom in a different way that achieves some of the same effect that parents are looking for. Parents want to know that their child is getting the attention they deserve. So when we say, and I'm, obviously I was a public school parent for 20 years, when we say, close to 20 years, whatever it was, it was a long time. Uh, when we say, I want lower class size, we are saying in effect, I want to make sure my child gets the attention they deserve, I want to make sure it's a good learning environment, I want to make sure it's conducive, I want to make sure it's safe, etc. One of the ways we are doing that now, I've talked about the literacy effort. That's going to be a huge investment in reading specialists. Those reading specialists are going to be able to address individual children's needs or small groups of children, pull them out of the classroom, address them or in the classroom separately. That is going to change in second grade, third grade, what happens in that classroom. It's a different way of trying to achieve some of the same outcomes. And Carmen can talk about some of the other strategies. 
but we have clearly, we do have a physical space challenge. Because even with the investments we're talking about, as Lorraine referenced earlier, finding the places to put the new schools, getting agreement from the community, actually building them, we have a money problem and a space issue that we're working against. So one solution is $4 billion, and in your case, 1,500 new seats. Another solution is do more with the space we have and put more staff on it and more support on it for our teachers, please. One of the things that um, we actually just signed off on two weeks ago is that for any kindergarten class that's oversized, they will either be getting a paraprofessional part-time or the teachers will be getting extra relief time so we'll be able to work with small groups of kids if they wish to. So we are seriously looking at it. And I think the other question um, is also, by whose definition is too small too big? But we're actually looking at that city level. Um, there's no question in the world we want to address class size in every way we can. When I just said, though, this is a cold, hard reality. The four billion we are putting in to addressing overcrowding and to addressing class size isn't getting us far enough. Now you could say, I don't, couldn't disagree more with your interpretation of our quote unquote surplus. That's just not how we see it. That's how some other people see it. That's not how when we do a whole financial plan, we do not believe that is a fair way of characterizing it. We have a budget that is built to deal with the fact that if we have any kind of downturn in this economy, that we know two simple facts and we've learned them the hard way. In the event of a downturn in the New York City economy and revenues are plummeting and aid from the federal government is cut and aid from the state government is cut, we cannot turn to Washington for help. They will not respond. We cannot turn to Albany for help. They will not respond. I have built a budget that protects this city and protects the school system regardless of what happens in this economy. So to the quote unquote surplus, the notion here is to protect our schools and all the other services we provide. Because in the event of something going wrong in our economy, and that was not so long ago, you might all remember the Great Recession, something goes wrong, we will only have ourselves to depend on. In terms of the resources we have put in, we are very proud of the affordable housing plan. We believe it is absolutely necessary to keep people in the city. Uh, what I disagree with you on in terms of how you're interpreting our plans on housing is we're trying to help people stay in their own neighborhoods that are being forced out of their own neighborhoods. That means the very same people have kids in school right now being able to stay in their neighborhoods and keep their kids in school. And that is a priority to put the capital money into that plan so we can have that plan. To the larger question, are we always looking for other things we can do? Of course. We're not done. But what we have established as our priorities, we believe are the effective priorities. And in addition to the investment to create more classes, more um, seats, I should say, in addition to the investments to get kids out of trailers, the things I just talked about, what we're trying to do to make the classes work better that we have. The reading specialists at second grade are gonna be a key example of that. That's what we can do now. We will not stop, continue, will not obviously ever stop trying to address these issues. I'm not sure I want to do a commission. I'll consider that, and we'll let you know. One of the things, Laney, that we've been working on in the City Council has been to get the Blue Book Task Force to get a real honest picture of what's happening in the school system. And I want to congratulate and thank the task force for the work that they did, because I think that the, the outcomes of that task force have been great in showing us the number of where those seats are as well and what we have to do. It's a much more honest view of how space is being used in the school. Now, is there work to be done? In my opinion, there is. As the person who advocates for that, I will continue to advocate for that. But I want to say one other thing, too, because when I first became a city council member, there was no plan to remove the portables. And because of the advocacy of the council and because of the work together with the school construction authority and uh, the chancellor, now there is a plan. How we find space to put those kids in the meantime before we can get them out of the trailers really comes down to the biggest issue of all. Concerns about the, the very deeply flawed state tests. Yet your administration repeatedly states that they believe in these tests. And New York City continues to be the place in the state where test scores have the greatest weight. Governor Cuomo has said that these test scores should be meaningless for children, yet they are used as a factor in middle school and high school admissions. My questions are, do you understand the real reasons for the massive opt-out last year? And why is your administration's rhetoric so different from that of some of the most respected educators in the city? Well, I think there's several things I would contest there. First of all, 
we have moved so much <laughs> away from high stakes testing. What I said when I was running for office, I believe fundamentally. We acknowledge that there are federal and state laws that require high stakes testing in certain ways. We use those tests in a very, very different way than our predecessors. We don't grade schools anymore. We have fundamentally changed the weight that is given to those tests in terms of how we promote kids. We fundamentally changed how we do it in admissions. I mean, the whole across the board effort has been to reduce the emphasis in this school system on high stakes testing. Now, the opt-out movement, of course I understand what people are feeling. I was a public school parent. I saw I had my own frustrations, and my kids had their own frustrations about the test. And I would happily join with you and anyone to try and change the foundational assumptions about high state testing in Albany and Washington. I don't think, I think you're being a little generous to Albany because Albany is part of why we have such a reliance on high stakes testing. So my argument would be we should be resetting the entire equation. By the way, you notice now as No Child Left Behind is being discussed that suddenly there's a backing away rightfully from high stakes testing, we should obviously be doing all we can to push in that direction. But here we have de-emphasized it, we have redirected so many of the previous administration policies away from high stakes testing. The opt-out movement, therefore, I feel very kindred with the motivation. I just don't think the actual effort is without consequence. When parents opt out, it's voting with your feet. It's I can totally understand it in the context of democracy, but there's real consequences. We need to protect the long-term health of the school system, and there's a clear federal rule that if there is too much non-participation in tests, it can lead to a reduction in federal funding. We take that very seriously, and I think the more productive thing we can do together is to try and change the underlying policy. That's what I think will actually help us for the long haul. Chancellor. Well, I think several things are happening. First of all, we have a new state commissioner who, who really has said this all has to be rethought. She has a task force now, she welcomed parents' input. But I want to say also as a teacher, as a parent, and as a grandparent, I don't think that assessing kids is terribly wrong all the time. I think, I think test prep is wrong. I think when test prep takes the place of good teaching, good teaching should be test prep. And I've made it very clear to principals around the city that the only kind of test prep that I think is good is one that starts in February and it's more about how long does it take to sit. This commissioner has promised and has already started putting in less sitting time. We're going to have less questions on these exams. We're going to have teacher input into creating the exams. We're also going to be getting the test, the exams back so we actually get to see what's on them. One of the things that I think has been wrong about these exams is that they give them and that nobody knows what they got. We all know how they improve what they don't know. So that's one of the things that we have asked the she has agreed for you to be able to go online and see what the test questions were and also review what your kids get wrong. But, you know, there's never going to be a right or wrong answer on this. It's really, though, I believe strongly that one of the jobs kids have to some degree is to go to school and be accountable for what they learn. I don't think teachers should be graded on the results of no more than 30% of the test, because I do think there is an assessment piece, but that's it. And we said it publicly, and I think we finally, we have a commissioner who's working on this, and who has agreed to work with us. So I would say stay tuned on this one. We got rid of the promotional policy. We, we encourage teachers also to look at different kind of materials in their classrooms, not some that are ditto sheets and fill in the blanks kind of thing. So like I said, stay tuned, we're gonna be working on this. Okay, thank you, and we're going to go on.